Good afternoon, everyone. I'm C.V. Paracharya, Zoffer Chair in Sustainability and Ethics and Director of the Center for Sustainable Business at the University of Pittsburgh. The center is very happy to be co-hosting this conversation as part of our work on sustainable economic development Housed within the Katz Graduate School of Business and the College of Business Administration at Pitt, we work directly with companies who want to transition to more sustainable business models. It's my privilege to welcome you all to this discussion on a green and equitable recovery in the Ohio Valley, a conversation with local leaders from the region about their work to prioritize a green and equitable economic recovery. This is the fourth event in Climate Mayor's National Dialogue on a green and equitable recovery, a speaker series advocating for national leadership to prioritize recovery policies that are environmentally sustainable and socially just in the time of COVID-19. Climate Mayors is a network of 464 US mayors committed to upholding the Paris Climate Agreement and to taking meaningful and ambitious action on climate change in their communities. With that, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists and then move straight into the questions. We have Mayor Peduto of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Mayor Whaley of Dayton, Ohio, Mayor Cranley of Cincinnati, Ohio, and Mayor Brown of Youngstown, Ohio. Okay, let's move to the questions. It is recommended that answers be kept between two to three minutes. And the first question, is for all of you. Um, in this moment when cities and states are facing so many challenges, health, the economic downturn, racial justice, why should we care about climate change? Mayor Perduto, let's have you go first. Thank you, <clears throat> CB, thank you for putting this together. Um, climate change is a part of the total equation when we're looking at uh, where we are post COVID. So as we look at what type of a city we want to be, a, be in, uh, the type of world we want to create, we look at it in Pittsburgh through the lens of P4, people, planet, place, and performance. Uh, on the people side, we understand the equity issues that are being discussed and putting that as part of our economic development strategy. And we do so the same with our planet. How can we minimize the negative impacts and at that same time capitalize on the growing economy of a green economy? How do we uh, position this entire region as the leading region of this country and into the future of this world in the green recovery? And so it becomes a critical part of a, a four bottom line new economic development strategy. Thank you. Mayor Cranley. Look, I think th th this stuff hits us very practically. Um, you know, every citizen I know thinks we don't fix enough potholes and we put a lot more money into potholes. But because of landslides of record rainfalls that we've had, I think three 100 year rains in the last five years, we've had to invest on an emergency basis twice 30 million plus projects to fix uh, roads that could have jeopardized critical infrastructure and uh, roadways that you know transport 50, 60,000 people a day, uh, which means the potholes get to even later and taxes have to go up to pay for that kind of stuff. Um, I've had to shut the water off, uh, off the Ohio River when we've had oil leaks out of West Virginia uh, uh, coming down the Ohio River on a multiple basis, and we're all familiar with the tragedy of Flint, Michigan, when proper environmental standards aren't uh, followed. Um, and then you've got the, the fact that things are getting hotter, and so people need air conditioning, and that costs more money for the utility bills. Um, and so th this isn't just abstract, it, it is a direct financial implications on people's everyday lives. It's also the case that it's an existential threat to our food supply worldwide uh, uh, if we don't take it seriously. So I think we have a moral obligation to care for our kids and grandkids, but it's easy to forget that on a day-to-day -day basis, there are 
genuine expenses that people are incurring because of uh, these climate issues. Mayor Brown. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, like my colleagues just uh, alluded to earlier, I, I would actually start first with being uh, the previous uh, generations had some of the same challenges, uh, but I believe that they didn't take a, a hard look at, uh, for me, it would be infrastructure. If you look at the rain and the, and the water for places like Youngstown, Ohio, uh, we have an aging uh, water system, uh, aging pipeline, and we can't keep up with the infrastructure. But if you look at the, the number of rainfalls that we've had uh, just in my, my three years as a mayor, I could imagine if I go back 20 years, now we have what we call overhead dams and we're worried about flooding uh, in small towns uh, and tributaries outside of the city of Youngstown. So. Uh, we've got to be very cautious about what we do, and we got to really focus on the future. Uh, being a father and a grandfather, uh, what we do here today will affect my kids and my grandkids, uh, but it also will affect the infrastructure. That's that's the piece that no one, the, what you don't see is what's not um, classy. People don't mind what's under, they, but until it breaks and then you have to pay, and when you're asking the taxpayers uh, that I have to fix those 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 immediate pieces or we're gonna see more flooding or, or, or sewer backup is in, in people home in people's home, uh, it, is, it is critical piece for us. So uh, those are just a few of the challenges that you're talking to me about. Uh, there's multiple out there that we can deal with um, as mayors right now in, in this, this time that we live. Thank you, thank you for that. And last but not least, Mayor Whaley. Yeah, thanks for being here and appreciate uh, particularly Mayor Peduto's leadership on this work as we think about the Ohio Valley and its role in uh, climate change and what we can do to really protect and showcase our communities in this, in this work. I mean, I think what all the mayor said is exactly right. In, in 2019, Dayton experienced tornadoes, dozens of them coming through the center city, something that didn't happen uh, before until climate change uh, and extreme weather that we're seeing. But I think the other issue is, is we just simply can't afford not to. Uh, as mayors, we a lot of times have to lead in places that the federal government just refuses to do anything. Uh, uh, we've seen that with this administration, for example, and you know, cities across the country have still said, no, we're still in the Paris Climate Agreements, and we have to do this work because of what we're seeing, not only in our own communities, but communities across the country and the world. You know, the wildfires of California did affect Ohio. Uh, you know, we, we had increased levels of air quality because of what's happening in, in California this past, this past couple of weeks, uh, in this past month. And this work, uh, we can stem the change and protect, um, protect our communities, create really amazing jobs for the future, which is something that our, our communities in this region have been good at and also make sure that we, uh, we have a, a, a future that is good for, uh, for our future generations. Thank you. So I think we can summarize that by saying not only is it the right thing to do morally, but also the smart thing to do from, from a business and future perspective. Wonderful. Uh, so now I'm gonna ask you one question each individually. Um, so Mayor Perduto, starting with you, what have the past six months taught us about the intersection of issues like COVID, climate, racial justice, and how are you addressing the systemic failures that have contributed to our current crises in Pittsburgh? Well, I think it first shows us that um, we aren't resilient, um, at least on a national level. Uh, we weren't prepared for a pandemic uh, to be able to respond to it in a way that uh, would be sustaining for our cities and our states. Uh, we find ourselves financially in a situation that uh, is going to need some uh, help uh, in order to be able to make up for the lack of a, a, a resilient strategy. Uh, secondly, I think we also realize that um, what we are seeing in a short term over the past six months, you know, could last uh, for at least another year. Uh, and understanding that that will also require a coordinated effort in order to be able to dig ourselves out. Um, I believe that in the city of Pittsburgh, we have been a little bit better off 
than in other regions. Uh, since June, our housing market has been the third strongest in the country. Um, and, you know, part of that due to the demand that is there uh, and not having uh, over built out prior to it. Uh, so lessons learned, I think we're still in the process of learning uh, and we probably won't know uh, really the true lessons for at least another six months. Mayor Whaley, as you seek to address climate change, what policies or programs are you prioritizing in Dayton to address the nexus of jobs, justice, and the environment? Quite frankly, Day Dayton's been at this for some uh, quite some time. Uh, actually, back in 1985, uh, which you know I was in elementary school at this time, we had a uh, fire along a well field, uh, a painting supply company that really um, threatened our water system. And so the, the city commission at the time put in together an environmental advisory board, uh, which has been a nine member board of both scientists and um, citizens that are interested in environmental concerns that really have helped guide the city over the past 30 years on this work. Uh, we've been working, you know, from putting together, making sure we have complete streets and have bicycle action planned for our community. So we think of sustainability, not just in, you know, how we get our water or how we use our energy, but also how we get around. And so uh, we've done that making sure that we recognize that we are an urban place. And so having tree canopy goals to increase the number of, of trees in our community, uh, number one, makes those great neighborhoods Mayor Peduto was talking about, makes the market stronger, but also helps us on our urban footprint for heat. Uh, so we've done all of those things, but I'm most excited this past year that we hired a sustainability manager that sits uh, in the administration so we can make these a priority for the entire organization and the entire city. And just last month, we passed our sustainability plan that has 115 points of action for us. So a serious detailed plan of ways that we're going to work for both small, uh, short-term and long-term goals uh, to really do that next generation of work for us as a mid-sized city in Ohio. Uh, these, these will be, I think, important for us. And again, the long-term belief that we're already behind in this work of, of, for climate in our world, but then also short-term ways that we can measure and hold ourselves accountable as a community. Uh, I'm really excited about this work and really proud that the city has, even amidst COVID, said, this must happen and did this vote during the middle of this unprecedented pandemic. Excellent. Um, Mayor Cranley, climate change is a horizontal issue. It cuts across issues of race, equity, and the economy. So how are you working to ensure climate action is meaningful in Cincinnati and is bringing multiple benefits to all of the communities in your city who already may be facing a host of other challenges? Yeah, it's a constant uh, challenge, uh, but important. For years, the city has been involved uh, with an agency, Greater Society Energy Alliance, um, to help subsidize and pay for the weatherization of homes. Uh, utility bills uh, are very regressive and hurt uh, a lot of times senior citizens on a pension and uh, home ownership. And so there is a massive effort in lower to middle class neighborhoods to help people weatherize their homes. And of course, if you weatherize your home, not only are you saving money, but you're also reducing your consumption of fossil fuels. Uh, so it's a win-win. Uh, I'm a huge fan of, of the tree canopy issues that Mayor Whaley mentioned. Cincinnati's had a longstanding uh, tree assessment for property owners. Uh, and so we go out of our way to plant trees in lower income neighborhoods. And some famous urban has said, you can tell the wealth of a street by how many trees are on the street. And so I, I'm a huge believer in adding to that tree canopy and the health effects that, that, that come with it. In addition, on our investments uh, in renewable sustainable energy, uh, we uh, are contracting, in fact, with an African-American owned business on the largest installation of solar uh, project in America, over 100 uh, eight, uh, um, megawatts of solar panels, uh, which is uh, very large. And uh, the company that's in, uh, running the program is uh, a 
African-American owned business. So we try to incorporate inclusion in all aspects of what we do uh, as imperfectly as we do it, but it is an intentional effort that we are, we are making. Thank you, thank you for that. And Mayor Brown, your town and surrounding communities have been front and center recently in the conversation about the old economy versus the new. This has been a disruptive few years to say the least. So where do things stand right now as your area of the state is looking to new opportunities? How is your community responding to this change? CB, I think that's the, the, the opportunity is the, the big word. Uh, with where we are with COVID-19, if you've ever had an ounce of innovation uh, in your city or in your uh, leadership, this is a perfect time to really bring innovation uh, to the forefront. Um, I think places like Youngstown, Ohio, and um, I've said this and I said time and time again, we can't look to, uh, to our past. We, we have to look to our future, but also we've got to identify the opportunities that are there. Uh, some of the things that we're doing on the environmental uh, front right now that are, there are really, it's a big piece for us is uh, we've, we've taken on a, a smart two network uh, transportation grant where we are focusing on autonomous shuttle. And, you know, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you uh, when I watched the Jetsons when I was growing up, uh, I just thought it would never happen. And, and here I am, a, a mayor of a city of Youngstown, and we're talking um, off opportunity of an autonomous shuttle uh, to transport uh, individuals from our downtown to our university to our hospital system um, to reduce the carbon emission in a, a, set, a city like Youngstown, Ohio. But also there's electric vehicles that you, if you, if you uh, paid attention to Lordstown, uh, we, we took a, a significant hit uh, with losing Lordstown, but then there's opportunities there where we can maybe uh, move it to the new direction. I, I know with my recent trip to China, uh, electric batteries and uh, electric vehicles were, were huge. And, and if I look at places like Youngstown, Ohio, and in the Ohio Valley, uh, I think there's so much more potential right now for the mid Midwest cities to be really engaged in the new future of electric batteries and electric vehicles. Uh, for, so I think that's the piece that we can now say, What's innovation? Uh, for me as mayor, uh, let me at least start with one charging station in my city uh, would be an innovation piece. So uh, we're moving towards, towards that. Uh, we're encouraging that. Uh, but I think I have to lead from the front and say, listen, uh, we will try uh, and, and use this opportunity as, as a, growth, uh, a growth moment for us as a city and, and as well as for a valley. Very, very nice, very well put. Uh, let's go back to a question for, for all of us now, for all of you. Um, given the extraordinary budgetary pressures that cities and states are currently under, how is climate change showing up in your budgets right now? Is the economic downturn impacting your investments in climate action? What steps can or should you be taking now to establish the foundation for future growth, setting our communities on a path towards a healthier economy that is just, equitable, and more resilient to future shocks. Let's go in reverse order this time from last time, and let me see if I can pull that off. So, Mayor Whaley. Yeah, so I think uh, one, of, one thing I'd say is the city is still making this a priority, right? As I mentioned before, still working forward on our plan, still, still <laughs> passing this work, and still making these, these, um, these efforts top of mind but it has slowed down the overall investment right as we've had to deal with really tough budgets there the 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 investment night might not happen as quickly also though we are seeing opportunities in that uh, an example is the city because of the budget issues had to recently close two of our golf courses and now we're looking at those for solar array right because what do you do with a defunct golf course so there are different opportunities i think what is important for us as mayors is when we have, and I mean, we, we lead through crisis, that's pretty much the job. When you have those crises, where is the opportunity to think of sustainability and always being top of mind about that opportunity and sustainability, no matter what the crisis that is on your plate that day? Mayor Brown? I think uh, as, as my, my colleagues mentioned, uh, one of the things that I, I've looked at is that uh, we're, even though during a pandemic, I, th I talk about the national narrative is becoming more of a local narrative. It's how do we take uh, this pandemic and how do we make sure that uh, there's some norm normalcy uh, to what we're doing? I think the most, most important for me is that we look at our lighting and our admission 
uh, of making sure that we continue with our public utilities and that we're, we're, we're still providing, you know, the updating and upgrading um, from the old uh, sodium lighting as well as now to the LED lighting in our, in our city. But I, I'll be the first to, to tell you that uh, cities, uh, Youngstown, Ohio, uh, we've really got to continue uh, to push this even stronger. Uh, the tree canopy, and we've, we've been uh, a tree USA uh, for some time with our park and rec, but really focusing on those neighborhoods to make sure that we are planting seeds uh, of trees that, and, and that we'll never see the shade of. Uh, but I think we've got to make sure that we continue, uh, even during a pandemic, that we push uh, for those issues to be there. Uh, if it's not a priority uh, today, make sure tomorrow it, it is. Uh, but because it's going to be here, uh, it's not going anywhere, and we've got to deal with it. Thank you. Mayor Cranley. Well, the climate issues are causing budget problems. As I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, the 100 year rains that come every couple of years now um, have created huge holes of infrastructure that we have to fix on an emergency basis, which then delays everything else. It's also the case that uh, Nan Tito and I live in a state where the government itself is busting our budgets on a family basis. So they literally just passed a bill, um, the most corrupt bill in the history of the state, to uh, raise jack up fees on people's utility bills, take that money to bail out a coal plant in Indiana, which obviously is a fossil fuel bur burning uh, energy facility, among other things. Uh, and the same bill, they, they eliminated renewable energy standards that have been proven to save money uh, to families and uh, to consumers supply and creating jobs in Ohio and one of the fastest growing industries was renewable energies. So the, the crisis. Having some audio issues. I think Mayor Cranley froze on us. Uh, maybe we'll uh, Ash, can, should we go to Mayor Peduto and then come back? Yes. So, Mayor Peduto, let's continue. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll carry on with uh, Mayor Cranley uh, was talking about, and you know, Pittsburgh and Cincinnati have very similar topography, and we've been facing the same issues with these 100-year rain events. Um, it got to the point, you know, just a little over a year ago where a pothole ate a bus in downtown Pittsburgh. Um, the, the, the amount of infrastructure costs on the expenditure side have been exponentially increasing where we had spent on average uh, a million or less on landslides. We're now spending over $10 million on landslides. And that's just over the course of the past five or six years. Um, so we're seeing the costs in a very real way um, throughout the Ohio Valley in the amount of rain that falls during these events. Uh, secondly, it also opens up the opportunity on the revenue side to look for new partnerships, um, especially where we're investing our pension funds. Uh, Pittsburgh was one of 12 cities around the world that had made a commitment to divest from fossil fuels. And in that decision, we not only committed the divestment, but also the investment in looking at the green economy as a potential way of being able to enhance our portfolio and taking some of it away from Wall Street and uh, improving our local economy by helping companies that are looking at a long-term uh, venture in the green economy. There is no doubt that Western Pennsylvania is going to be hit when, uh, as the transition from fossil fuel to green energy happens. But we can prepare for it, unlike we did with the steel industry collapse. And over the course of the next 20 years, have a clear economic development strategy uh, that allows us to make that transition seamlessly. 
and invest back in the people who have for over a hundred years built this country on fossil fuels in the communities that they call home. Great. Um, do we have uh, Mayor Cranley back with us? Ash, or should we continue? He's there, he just needs to unmute. John, ah. you need to unmute. Might be having trouble unmuting. Oh, there you go, you're unmuted now, John. Oh, now you're muted again. <laughs> okay, you're unmuted again. Try talking. No, now he's, now he's frozen. I don't know what's going on with Mayor Cranley. Uh, it's move on. I'm getting a, I'm getting the um, sign to move on, but uh, you know maybe we'll come back to him in a few in a few minutes. Uh, all of you might have remembered. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw when Kamala Harris ca came with uh, Tina Fey and uh, Maya Rudolph uh, and Amy Poehler, excuse me, and, and all kinds of funny things happened with Hillary Clinton. Uh, but uh, Mayor Peduto, a question for you. Um, and this is a germane one um, for me and our, our center and you. Can you speak to the role you see cities playing in driving action on climate change through economic recovery and the importance of partnerships uh, among cities, philanthropic organizations, academic universities, at the local, state, federal levels? And how has that helped Pittsburgh in advancing that effort and ensuring that vulnerable communities are, are prioritized? Well, CB, the work that we've been doing with you is, is centered around that exact philosophy that uh, we can drive change at the local level and we can model it after a successful American program, the Marshall Plan, uh, that was able to bring back devastated cities throughout Europe through creative public-private partnerships uh, in the areas that uh, had been devastated. So as we all are still feeling the effects of deindustrialization, cities like Huntington, West Virginia, Morgantown, West Virginia, Youngstown, Ohio, Dayton, Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, Louisville, Kentucky, and Pittsburgh are working together in order to be able to pull together a strategy, an American Marshall Plan for the middle America. Uh, the idea that we can be leaders once again in the rebuilding of America and the retooling of it is evident in a place in Pittsburgh called Phipps Conservatory, where they have been able to build the world's highest environmental standard building. It, it's called the Living Challenge, where you build a building that uses no more energy than a plant. And the fact is, is that not only was the building built locally, but all of the materials inside of it, the engineering, the construction, the materials around it, all came from a 100 mile radius, meaning that this area of the country already has the companies in place. We've got to figure out how to increase them. As Mayor Brown was saying about these autonomous buses, electric buses, the, the storage power, we're getting our clock cleaned by China. Over 90% of all the electric buses on the streets in the world come from China. They should be built in Detroit. They should be built in Youngstown. They should be assembled in West Virginia. And we should have a complete strategy around the green economy that is based upon the Marshall Plan model that uh, came out in the 1940s. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Whaley, how are you working to rebuild post-COVID-19 in Dayton? Are mayors in a unique position to confront these multiple crises? Do cities have the bandwidth, the power, and the resources to address these multiple challenges? So I would say uh, we have to, we can't afford not to uh, do multiple challenges at the same time. But it is difficult when you don't have federal leadership. And so I think that is 
really, really important. You know, mayors can kind of hold it together and do the work that we're doing for our communities and make real significant gains. But we know if we had a true federal partner in this work, we could really take it up uh, multiple notches in this work, or just even a state partner, as Mayor Cranley pointed out in Ohio, where we have none. So I think there are, we, we always know when we have partnerships, we can do a lot more. But I'll also say this, you know, when you have a plan in place and, and you say, these are our goals and this is what we're looking for, when opportunities come your way, then you can really go after them. And I think that's what uh, makes, I think, mayor leadership, mayor's leadership so key in this because you can put that plan in place and then you can ask the questions every single time through the lens of sustainability. And I think that's how you, how you do it when we have so many other issues we're dealing with. Sustainability can really truly be in every single decision. That's music to my ears, <laughs> given where I come from. Um, mayor Brown, cities and towns across the Ohio Valley region have played a pivotal role in growing and strengthening the nation's economy. In recent years, the region has faced challenges. How are towns in the Ohio Valley reimagining the future? And what role do you see for mayors in guiding their communities through this transition? I think mayors are gonna to have to be the, the leaders. I think they're gonna to have to lead the band uh, in that direction. And when you, when you talk about uh, cities and towns, uh, everyone's gonna realize that it's, we're, we, it's not just one of us, it's all of us. Uh, we can't work in isolation anymore. Um, whether you're a big city or small city, uh, what we're having conversations on now needs to continue to happen as a network of mayors, you know, whether you're Republican or Democrat mayor. The dollars are, are getting smaller, but the innovation has to get larger. Uh, we've got to be more creative. We've got to have a, a sense from one another. Uh, what's, what's important to uh, my, my city versus Pittsburgh or Cincinnati or Dayton but we can all go to our, our, our federal legislators, our state legislators and say, here's, here's what we believe we have and what we need. Uh, we just need them to understand that we're putting a plan together uh, and that we're working together. I think you, you heard us talk about, it's gonna have to be the private public partnership. And if we're, we're gonna do it, if we're gonna move this community forward, uh, we've gotta get those who are investing already in, in our communities, but we also gotta give them an incentive uh, or a plan that says, you know what, if you stick with us and there, our plan is gonna work, uh, here's what you can, here's how you can benefit from that. So it's gotta be a network of, of us uh, coming together, but it's always gotta be a plan for us to deal with that. And I think uh, just the pure conversation we're having today is a, just a prime example of what, what needs to continue to transpire uh, with mayors across uh, just this valley, but across the nation as well. Indeed, yeah. That's, that's a cool. Wise man once said, you know, partnership is the new leadership. So maybe collaboration is indeed the, the need of the hour. Um, I, Mayor Crowley, are you back on with us? Do you, does anybody Hopefully. Uh, oh, hey, had, bravo. bravo. I've had some major technical issues. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries, no worries. Uh, we were wondering whether you just uh, popped off to catch up on the, on the, on the game. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me ask you a question. So as you seek to craft climate policy in Cincinnati and transition to a clean energy economy, what role do you see for cities in Ohio to work together in advance of your shared priorities? Oh, I think it's super important. First and foremost, to share good ideas um, and exchange and network. Um, Number one. Number two is that some of these investments require uh, economies of scale. Uh, for example, uh, the solar project that we're building, which we're very proud of, uh, is very large. And, and frankly, it's going to save us money uh, over the prevailing rate of fossil fuel energy at, its, at the size and for the amount that we're using. And we couldn't, we can't replace 100% of our usage because the sun doesn't shine at night, obviously. But for about 25% of our, our consumption, we're able to get a cheaper price because at three o'clock in the afternoon on a hot day, you know, that's when energy is the most expensive when you're cranking your air conditioning. And so it's better to be selling energy at that time than buying. And that's essentially what we're doing by building solar panels. But in order to get the economies of scale to make the costs come down on a, on a uh, per unit basis, you got to have a really big project. 
And so most cities aren't big enough to have that economy of scale opportunity, but they can bootstrap onto our uh, panels and take a smaller share at the same pricing as long as it's sort of jointly negotiated or negotiated within a reasonable period of time. So we're offering that up to other cities now across the state. There's no, it doesn't give us any financial benefit one way or the other, but it gives other cities and municipalities who want to get into this supply business uh, an opportunity to get the pricing we got at a, at a large, at a large scale pricing. Mm -hmm. It's very, 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 very interesting. Um, let's take a couple of questions from, from the audience. And these are, are obviously um, open to, to all of you, any or all of you, whoever wants to jump in. Um, so here's an interesting question. Um, how can we better sell renewable energy as an environmental and economic lifeline to Midwestern communities? I think it's uh, really incumbent upon us to be able to show the economic benefit of the transition towards the green economy. It's, you know, I, I used to have a saying that was, uh, if you want to take a gun out of a kid's hand, put a paycheck in it. Uh, I think that the same thought, if you want to turn a mine worker into an environmentalist, put a paycheck in their hand. You need to be able to show, especially to the areas outside of our cities, that their communities can be sustained and prosper as being a part of this. Uh, in order to make this change, you're gonna to need to win people's hearts and minds. And in order to be able to win their hearts and minds, you're gonna to have to speak to their pocketbook. And for the communities that are seeing coal mines close down, uh, that are seeing the bust of the boom and bust shale industry, they need to be given a opportunity to see the benefits of what these new jobs would be. If we, as we look at the upper Appalachia, uh, Northern Appalachia has the opportunity right now to become the center of solar panel construction of solar panel assembly, uh, solar panel installation. And those are good union jobs that we're talking about. And we need to be able to show that that community that was uh, built around that factory or that power plant can be continued around that solar panel plant. Yeah. And anyone else wants to um, weigh in on that? Uh, CB, I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in. Just a couple of things I would like to add to that. I, I think as we talk about renewable energy, I think there's an educational component because uh, I think it's it's something that it's kind of um, a figure. Uh, it's kind of out in the air. It's nothing that it's relative. If you don't see it, you know, we're talking. This might be the first generation in a community that is really serious about it. But some don't real, they don't realize it. And, and like the mayor said, you got to really show them the benefit. And so I think there's an educational component and they need to see the benefit, um, but they need to see the long-term benefit. It's not just, I'm going to get a paycheck, but there's a career that they can, they can gain, but also you're, you're taking a long-term benefit for the next generations to come. So I just think those are two pieces that uh, we need to make sure. Um, and for me, I need to become uh, that, that ambassador to, to educate them on why this is such a benefit. I think, I think the key point, and Bill said this, Mayor Peduto said this, it's, it's this idea of how um, the, the good work to make our climate more se secure and to really deal with climate change has to be an economic driver for this region, for this region too. And so, I mean, a lot of the work, I, I've been at City Hall now for 15 years, mayor for seven, and what I've noticed on the economic work and economic drivers, the best ones are the ones where the seeds are planted and they are continually worked on around how we can really diversify our economy, which is really key for communities in the Ohio Valley and making sure that green jobs are a big part of that, that it's not just something that automatically goes to the coast, but is thought of places like Youngstown at their Youngstown incubator or in Dayton. Uh, that we develop those because because that is really key too 
to making sure that the whole country is invested in, 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 in this idea of sustainability. Uh, if we have and continue to have winners and losers on an economic driver uh, uh, that we've seen in the past, we're going to continue ha to have troubles with the overall country believing on how important this is. And so it's not only important for our communities, but it's really important for the future of our country as well. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Whaley. Uh, Mayor Crowley, you good on this one? Or? Yeah, they covered it pretty well. Thank you. Um, well, here's another one. And again, open open to all of you. We'll let, we'll let Cranley go first this time, Steve. Yes, we will, absolutely. Uh, I think he just celebrated a, <laughs> a run or something there. No, uh, I about, wish. Uh, Opposite. <laughs> how can our region's pension funds move beyond ESG to investing locally through ETIs, economically targeted investments? I had a hard time hearing you, but you're asking about uh, using pension monies to be invested in cities. Is that what I heard you say? Right. So beyond going using the pension funds, moving those going beyond ESG, the environmental, social, and governance funds to investing locally through economically targeted investments. Yeah, this is something, uh, sadly, I've looked into quite a bit because we, we're one of the few cities in Ohio that has a pension fund um, that's separate from the Ohio pension fund. Um, and it's, a, it's frankly not a fun thing to have. Uh, and, difficult economic times. Um, but uh, we have pushed this envelope a few times and get fierce resistance from fiduciaries, et cetera. And uh, if you haven't read some of this stuff, Bruce Katz, who's a good friend of some of us on this call, who's active with the Accelerator for America, which many of us are involved in here, um, talks about how there is an insane amount of money that is generated in the Midwest that is being spent in Silicon Valley or New York City chasing very small margins, where the, the innovations that do break out in the Ohio Valley and the Midwest are far more profitable. And yet there is a group think around the venture capital money that goes, you know, it's our pensions that go and get spent in California, New York. So I don't claim to know how to solve this problem. Um, and I know Bruce Katz and others have written with some suggestions but God knows I'd love to be able to take um, a plan that would be acceptable for two fiduciaries to do that kind of stuff with the two or so billion dollars that we have in our pension. So I, so I think it's a great idea. Um, it, it meets with fierce resistance, legal resistance, not just policy resist, uh, resistance, lawsuits. Uh, and so figuring out how to break that code would be, would be awesome. And, and I'm all ears because I don't, I don't know how to do it. Mayor Peduto? Well, as you're aware, CB, this is one of the uh, key components of what we're looking at as the uh, American Marshall Plan. Uh, one of the ideas is to be able to put together a regional economic development strategy uh, that could be pitched to Washington as early as the first quarter next year to be able to make the investments that we're talking about. But the second component of it is locally, what can we do with our own funds in order to be able to provide incentive to local companies to expand or to increase their portfolios? I mean, this isn't something that is closed to the fossil fuel industry. This is an opportunity for them to expand their portfolio into other areas as well and invest right back into our own communities. We want to be able to partner with them in this type of an exercise. Uh, the work of uh, Tom Croft in the Heartland uh, organization uh, looks directly at this issue and takes it on head straight, being able to cite examples from around the country where cities have been able to utilize their pension funds for just this purpose. What we need to do is emulate that plan and to be able to present it across uh, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Kentucky. Uh, what I think it does is the great work that Patricia DeMarco is doing with her group with Reimagine Appalachia, 
this provides a funding source to take those types of initiatives and actually get them done. It also brings in the political leadership from this region, as well as the university and academia. Each one of us have a great university, at least one great university in all, each of our cities. And we need to be able to partner with them, our philanthropic community, our pension funds, federal funding, organized labor, environmentalists, private companies, in order to be able to make that type of an initiative actually happen. Terrific. Uh, Mayors Brown or Whaley, anything to add to that? I'm like Cranley, they covered it pretty well. Mm -hmm. All right, then we are coming to almost a close of our time. Uh, it's a fascinating discussion, but uh, one more question, kind of a closing question for, for, for all of you. Um, so as we close the discussion, can you leave us with your thoughts on, on what's next? I mean, in the absence of federal action, mayors have been left on their own to step up on climate change and have done so willingly. So regardless of the outcome in November, what role do you see for cities and states in pursuing an ambitious climate agenda in the months and years ahead? Who wants to go first this time? Or really? Yeah, I'll say a couple of things. Number one, I think, you know, you can't ignore the fact that, in, you know, what happens in 33 days is going to have a dramatic effect on how this country does on climate. And as much as, you know, we lead locally, it is so helpful when we have a national or a state partner. And in Ohio, we really have neither, as Mayor Cranley mentioned, on this issue. So that, that is a significant um, barrier for us. And so I think what you're seeing in a lot more discussion, frankly, is for us to take the judicial and legal routes uh, when it comes to uh, protecting our communities and giving our communities opportunities, uh, particularly as we look at just the dereliction of duty on House Bill 6, as Mayor Cranley uh, mentioned in Ohio that we have to hold folks accountable as well when they are actively, you know, you know, bailing out, you know, coal fired plants in Indiana, for example, with Ohio taxpayer dollars. So, so I think that's what you'll see from us as cities banding together, not only to like take action in our communities as well, but really use every avenue that we have in order to make a dramatic difference. And, you know, hopefully, we get better partners federally because then you could really see the leverage of local communities uh, making great impact, particularly in the Midwest on this issue. Mayor Brown. CB, I, I think one of the things is we have to realize that doing nothing is, is not an option. Uh, I think uh, we just can't say, well, if, if, if. Uh, we've got to say we will, we will, we will, uh, no matter who's in office. Because I think as we collectively look at it, uh, if you look at the, the, the climate, if you look at the wildfires, COVID-19, the civil unrust, rust, uh, the, the, the unjust that we have across the country, COVID-19, there are so many other issues that we, we have to continue to fight. And this is on that list of priorities that we must continue to fight for and fight, fight am among uh, those who don't want it. We've got to continue to push them out of our way. Uh, we can't let them be barriers or distractions uh, to the, the real issue. And, it's, and that's uh, leading first uh, and leading through some difficult times. And this is not going to be easy because many people think it's a fantasy. Um, that was like Fantasy Island when I grew up. Um, that, that This is not that. This is reality and this is the harsh reality that we live in in, the, in this, this world right now. Yeah, the cost of inaction is actually higher than the cost of action. People always say, well, there's not money. Well, you know. So, yeah. Crowley. yeah, you know, for a hundred years, progressives have rightly looked to the federal government to advance important issues uh, like civil rights, women's rights, uh, educational expansion, things of those uh, of, uh, of our collective goals, gay rights. And, and I think we delegated and abdicated in, in some ways our environmental responsibility to the federal government. And um, it would be very nice uh, if we got a new president who would reprioritize those things. 
But the fact of the matter is that because we live in a federalist country where we have such much stronger local and state governments compared to other countries, the fact is that w whether Obama's president or uh, Biden or Trump, you know, until the Paris Accord uh, removal, I didn't think to see if I could get 25% of my energy consumption uh, from solar. I was inspired, you know, for the wrong reasons, but to do the right thing. And so I just think that if you look at the, at the end of the day, you know, the biggest crisis is carbon footprint. So if, if we could reduce it by 50%, by 2035 or whatever, you know, that can't happen unless we do it at the local level. You know, even if the federal government said we wanted to do it, they would need the cooperation and collaboration of local governments across the country. So we can do so much without a federal partner. I think we can do more with a federal partner, but you know, it really is up to us. And I think there's no excuse not to act. Last but not least, Mayor Peduto. Yeah, I, I first want to thank fellow mayors, uh, for uh, joining with us with this initiative that CB has been working on with uh, Leslie Marshall, uh, the University of Pittsburgh, Columbia University as well, uh, and Jeffrey Sachs. Um, I do believe that the partnership of our four cities, along with Huntington, West Virginia, Morgantown, West Virginia, and Louisville, Kentucky, can over the course of these next couple of months help to create an economic development strategy that a new administration could address during the first quarter uh, of next year. I believe that we need to be able to speak with one voice uh, and understand that a just transition begins with how we take care of people in the building out of a green economy, how we take care of the communities that they call home, and how we work together uh, and not try to just create a system that just checks the box of sustainability without understanding that sustainability begins on how we treat our fellow men and women. Uh, and I do believe that our region has the history of building this country once, and we could be counted on to rebuild it a second time. Thank you, Mayor Purito. That's very that's very insightful. And you know, as someone who's worked with uh, corporations uh, for for most of his life, I actually find that the challenges are not that dissimilar. I mean, it's always kind of you know, are you going to take ownership? of the problem and are, are you going to make it everybody's job or not? I mean, so when Mayor Whaley said, you know, everybody's got to do business through the lens of sustainability or actions through the lens of sustainability, that's exactly what we need. And uh, as, as the title of my book says, you know, small actions actually lead to big difference. So if everybody does their part, then collectively we can make, make a big impact. Um, fascinating conversation, and we could go on for for a long, much longer. But uh, you know, I need to be mindful of time. So thank you all for for joining us. Uh, the recording of this event will be available shortly on the Center for Sustainable Businesses YouTube channel. Uh, but before we leave, I want to thank all of those who who made this event possible. Um, our four panelists and their staff members. Uh, James Strickshot and the U.S. Climate Mayors for inviting us to co-host this event, BPI Media for their support, my colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh, Leslie Marshall, Alyssa Martinek, and Ash Brady, and especially to all of you in the audience for joining us today and taking the time to engage with these critically important issues. Thank you and goodbye. Stay safe.